This is Rob Tabbitt for Boxing Social in association with Betfred. Delighted, as always, to be joined by Eddie Hearn. Looking very uh, nice day where you are, Eddie. How are you, sir? I'm good. Well, I'm sorry for the squinting, but it's very bright out here. I've just realised I've actually just came come outside for the first time today. I didn't realise how bright it was. Uh, but a little bit of new matching apparel. Obviously, the guns are on point. Um, not. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, feeling good, mate. Feeling good. Starting to feel like life is coming back to normal. I've enjoyed it, Rob, to be honest with you. I mean, it's been weird for me. And it, for a while, it took me a long time to sort of get my head around this new way of life, which is actually quite relaxing and quite enjoyable. Um, but I miss the buzz. I miss boxing badly. And, you know, we, we're getting closer. The world seems to be improving now. Um, and, you know, in terms of coming out of this pandemic, and, and hopefully we're not too far away from some, from some live boxing. You mentioned, obviously, we're, we're kind of at the point now where things are starting to develop. Obviously, we've heard a lot about Fight Camp. My sources tell me that we're waiting on an announcement this week. How close are we to announcing Fight Camp? Yeah, we're, we're, we're close. I mean, I've learned the hard way and in many ways before about jumping the gun for an announcement. Um, they've got to be at the right time. The difference with these announcements as to a normal announcement is there's no need to get the tickets on sale. <laughs> so normally you would want eight or nine weeks to get the tickets on sale, build the event, you know, and, and drive the interest of an event. We still want to do that for Fight Camp, but obviously we're now, I think, six weeks out this Saturday from the proposed first date, which is July 25th. So we're on the verge. You know, we're at a point now where we've got most of the cards set up. We are still working on the Dillian White, Alexander Povetkin, Katie Taylor, Serrano um, set up of the final show. And it's hard work, Rob. I won't lie. You know, it's uh, it's been very, very challenging, not just because the the loss of revenue to these shows but also because of the testing procedures and the new way of life around the initial return of boxing so it's definitely something we'll never forget but fight camp's looking good and uh, we're on the verge of that and in america as well you know where looks like july 25th will be our first date back in the uk and it looks like august the 8th or 15th will be our first date back in the us so things starting to pick up and we just hope that things improve at a rate that we see arenas open up and we see crowds to come back as soon as possible because it will affect the bigger stuff you know um, obviously pay-per-view is pay-per-view but the, lo the loss of a gate is going to really affect the financials of these shows and it's, it's been a, a mission trying to navigate around that what can you tell me with regards to fights obviously we've seen um, Jordan Gill Reese Bellotti Sam Eggington Ted Cheeseman those kind of fights mentioned recently is there anything more that you can tell me yeah, I mean, um, there are a couple of examples that have been made. I mean, across the board, Felix Cash against Jason Wellborn, Jack Cullen against um, Jason Quigley, obviously Luther Clay against Congo, Valili against Wardley, Tennyson against Gwyn, uh, Nav Mansuri against Kieran Conway. You know, really good. I mean, all of those fights I've just mentioned there are arguably 50-50 fights. So I think one fight that was a bit disappointed that didn't get made was... Um, Connor Ben against Chris Jenkins. You know, we fired in a great offer that I know Chris Jenkins was over the moon with, but unfortunately they wouldn't give him permission to take that fight, which was disappointing. Um, so we're looking for an opponent for Connor Ben. Uh, obviously, Terry Harper against the Tasha Jonas world title fight. Um, so there's some cracking fights on there, and I'm actually really looking forward to it. I think you're going to get great nights of entertainment um, before we return in September with some more. And, you know, the likes of Joshua Boatze, Josh Kelly. Um, and then looking at even the bigger guys from there, perhaps the world champions, people like Callum Smith, people like Josh Warrington, you know, Billy Joe Saunders. How are we going to navigate their return? It's going to be really interesting. You mentioned boxing being back on kind of, well, hopefully soon, both sides of the Atlantic. I was up till the wee hours of the morning watching top ranked shows last night. What have you made of top ranked return? Last night? Uh, it, was, it was okay. The second show has been the best show by far so far. That was the third one, right? That was the third one, yeah. Um, I think they made a mistake with the launch because I think you, you have to make a decision, Rob, in this kind of environment and, and with these kind of numbers. You either make the B-level fights against, you know, B-level fighters against B-level fighters or A-level fighters against C and D-level fighters because it's all that the budget allows you to do, you know. So I can't sit here and criticise the quality of a top rank show because we're up against it. But I think in that instance, what they did was they put a lot of their guys in with weaker opposition. 
and it was a bad look to return with. Now, I, I did see bits of the second show. You got some better fights on the undercard. There's no point lying to people. At the moment, the money is not there to make the bigger fights outside of pay-per-view. Now, we're not going to come back with four pay-per-view events. But what we can do is we can come back with really good fights that are going to really entertain you. And the problem with no crowd is and no atmosphere is that when you've got a one-sided fight, it's magnified tenfold, you know. And it's really difficult to get that kind of energy and that, that noise, of course, when you've got a shit fight. So what you're going to get from us is not one shit fight across the whole board. I mean, sometimes after the event, you say, oh, that was a bit shit. But on paper, you will say, bloody hell, every fight you see on paper, you will say, that's a good fight. That's a good fight. And that's what we want. Now, when we come back, the more challenging thing is to come back with the names that I mentioned. Boatsy's, Kelly's, obviously Callum Smith, Warrington. That's when it starts to get difficult because what we don't want to do, I feel like we've got a great opportunity to reset boxing here. Okay? And there's been a lot of talks about fighters taking less money, fighters taking tough fights. Yes, we have to. We were getting out of control, not just us, but the sport in general. We have to reset the market. We have to make competitive fights. And we will lose people on the way. You know? I'm sure there's going to be managers who say, no, 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 you know, I don't want my guy to take that fight. We want this easy fight here. And we're going to have to to turn around and say no because the buck stops with us you know when I see the social media and the Twitter no one's having a go at fighters no one's having a go at managers no one's even having a go at the broadcasters they're just having a go at the promoters and that comes with a job that comes with a territory so I don't want that stick I want you to say that was a great night of boxing and I really feel like the nights that we're putting together on fight camp I'm looking at them on the sheet and going that's a great night of boxing five fights on each card that's a great night of boxing. You know, you're going to get people moaning. I see it. You know, Cheeseman against Higginson. Oh, they're two guys that, you know, have been up there and back and up there. Yeah. But they're going to absolutely go toe-to-toe in a war for your entertainment. And that's what we need, Rob. We need to show people how great boxing is and how exciting it is. And we need the fights that, even without a crowd, are still compelling. And that's what we've been done. So, top rank, I think, mix and match, mix and match. Um you know, I think a bigger disappointment for them has been the ratings. You know, and you saw Dana White sort of digging it into Bob. Um, ratings were, were really poor. And that's because, I, I feel like a number of reasons. One, because there was no compelling fight. And two, because I don't think there was enough drive behind the narrative of the boxing return. You watch what we do with Fight Ken when we're up and running. It's going to be everywhere. It's going to be compelling. Um, and that's one of the reasons we've tried to be a little bit different and do something outdoors, you know, in that kind of environment. Because... We want to make sure that the fighters feel the bus as well. Before we carry on talking about uh, Fight Cam, you mentioned Dana White there. I did watch his uh, expletive-laden interview that he did with yourself and Mr. Bellew. Um, UFC came back first. They were the first sport back on television. You're somebody who you've never hid your, I guess you would call it, admiration for Dana White and the, the, the way in which he works. What are you going to take from the way the UFC have returned and implemented into boxing, if anything? Um... You know, you're quite right. And I said on the Hearn Bellew thing, I mean, it was a bit of a love in with, with Mr. White. And Bellew was hilarious because he sort of melted under the, you know, oh, Dana. But I think you always, you have to, in business and in life, you, you can't shy away from um, giving people credit or admiring things that people do, even if they're in the same industry as you, even if they're, a, you know, a rival or an idol. It doesn't really matter. So I think um, for us, I always say to our team, you know, watch what the UFC do. And it's not just down to the fights. It's down to, you know, the streaming, the build-up, the way in, the graphics, the backdrops, everything. Um, They're a huge company. You know, they were sold for $4 billion. And that's where we want to be. You know, I want to be in a position where Matrim and myself are boxing, you know. And we're working on that at the moment. And that's the long-term goal. You know, for me, there has to be one entity in boxing. I mean, it doesn't have to just just be me, but there has to be one controlling organisation to to make the sport what it needs to be to be a mainstream sport in the US. You know, over here, I feel like we've done a a great job. And I feel like, although we've not sound arrogant, although we are... 
not controlling the sport over here, but you know we have a huge, huge market share of the sport. We've been able to do that, and you've seen the results over in America. I feel like the only way it's going to work is is to get that model right, where we are the UFC of boxing. Some people might say impossible, what? but I, you know, I'll, I'll be straight. That's that's the goal, and you know we're talking to people about making that happen because. I don't think we're ever going to get in an environment in boxing where it's right. You're fighting it, you know? See you there. But there needs to be the ability to make these, what wouldn't be, cross-network and cross-promotional fights. You know, when you look at things like Errol Spence against Terence Crawford, both guys are up for that fight. You know, that's a fight that really can... You know, you're, you're going back to... You know, it's hard to compare those days of Leonard and Hearns and Hagler, but that's the kind of quality that you'd get from a fight like that. And unless we show people the quality of boxing and the greatness of boxing and the best be the best, we'll never get to that level. So for us, I don't want to be, you know, when I look at boxing in America, and I've learned so much in the last couple of years, I don't want to be 20th in the rankings of sport or whatever it is. I want to be top five. And the only way you're going to do that for me is to have that controlling body who is able to make every fight that fans want to see. And that's what the UFC do. They, I'm not saying it happens like that, but gen generally they give fight the fights the fans want to see time and time again. And what they've come back with is really good content, is 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 competitive content. And I feel like that's what we need to do. They haven't come back with their top, top names. So I feel like we're a bit similar in that respect. But they've come back with 50-50 fights and solid cards. And that's what we want to do as well. When you say that you want to you know, become the UFC of boxing, it's not the first time I've heard you say that, and we've spoken about it numerous occasions over the years, but how do you do that when you've got Al Heyman with Fox, you've got Bob Aaron with ESPN? How do you how do you monopolize what seems to be the unmonopolizable, if that's even a word? Yeah, that's a good word, I suppose. Uh, I mean, look, there's, everybody's got a strategy. I'm sure Al Heyman had the same strategy when he had his $400 million worth of investment or whatever it was. Um, it didn't work. But he's still, you know, PBC is a very powerful brand in boxing in America. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of conversations, right? I mean, you know, we, we've gone from being a, a business that come out of Romford with 10 employees to a global business with offices all over the world. And you know, we reach a point now where we are one of the biggest sports promotional companies in the world. Forget boxing. And we're growing at such a rate and our numbers are growing at such a rate that you know, the next step for us is continued expansion. So where do we go from here? All right, you can just keep going as you're going and we have a nice life and we're doing really well. Thank you very much. But I'm not really built like that. You know, I want to test the boundaries. I want to explore new markets. I want to make sure that we can, you know, um, expand the sport. And I, I just feel that to make the sport what it needs to be, that's the model that, that needs to happen. Um, you are quite right. Is that is that doable? Well, you're only limited by your own imagination. And, uh, you know, it's. Um, I, I believe I'm the man for the job. I really do. I really believe that I'm the guy that can do that. I don't see anybody else that can do that in boxing. And um, that's my drive. What's the uh, status with the zone currently? We've seen a lot of varying different tweets, a lot of varying different information. What can you tell me about their current status? I think, I think that, you know, you live in a world, don't you? I mean, I'm sure you see it even across your business where, some of the stuff you read online is, is just hilarious. And one thing that I'm learning lately, it's like this creation of, I don't know whether, and you'll know more than me, whether they're like bot accounts or, like there's about 30 accounts that just have a PBC Logan on or Heyman's Planet or Heyman. Yeah. And they all say the same thing. So every time I tweet, they reply with the same thing. And I'm like, who is doing that? Do you know what I mean? And it's like, oh, DAZN's dead. Blavatnik's run out of money. Oh, oh. And I'm like reading it again. And then Joe Markoski will tweet, and the same thing will go. Or another DAZN fighter will tweet, and the same, you'll see the same, you know. So you've got to be careful what you read, really, just in general, in life. But DAZN are in a position where nothing's changed. You know, the focus, the strategy, the mindset of being a major player in the world of boxing is, is absolutely still there. Um, you know, I can't speak on Mr. Blavatnik's behalf, but I think he's fine. Thank you very much. And I believe he has a vision, hopefully like me, to see that we can make this sport extremely uh, powerful in, in, the, in the global landscape. And um, nothing's changed in terms of the number of shows. Nothing's changed in, in, 
you know, in, in terms of uh, what fights we want to do, just purely how do we come back? And for any sports streaming service that doesn't have live sport for three months, I don't think it's ideal for anybody. And this doesn't just go for DAZN, this goes for ESPN, this goes for Sky, this goes for BT. So it's been challenging for all businesses. But, you know, the mindset is we've got another call with them today. And, and that call is just really trying to finalise the schedule till the end of the year. I believe you'll see Golden Boy going, we last week of July. We'll be going with the fight camp with the zone and also with an American show with the zone in August. And then I think once we get back to September, you're going to see, um, see it flowing a, a lot better. You mentioned BT and Sky, and you're, you're right, and everybody's kind of struggling or starving for live content at the minute. But the zone being a streaming platform, being a relatively new business, has lockdown and COVID affected them more so than the others? Uh... Yeah, I guess so. I mean, look, you know, I think the Zone's biggest challenge was the lack of sort of brand presence, if you like, on through their launch and through their year and a half or whatever it is of, of uh, existence in America. So, you know, they're not ESPN, they're not um, Fox, but what they are is a service that's providing great value for fight fans. And I, I do believe there is huge brand loyalty as well for DAZN and what they're trying to do. Because if you're a fight fan and if you are depressed by 80 or $90 pay-per-views and you think, oh, I don't want to pay this for boxing anymore, I think you've been a supporter of DAZN. So it's not like the platform's just disappeared. You know, there has been content, there has been fights, there is archive, but it's still very challenging for a live event or a live sport uh, streaming service. And by the way, Rob, just like us, we're a live event company, Matrim, you know? So... And we've had no live events. So it hasn't been ideal. We've had to be creative. We've done some funky stuff. We've done some fruitful stuff. But we've done a lot of planning as well. So, um, yeah, probably more challenging for design because they had more hurdles initially. But we're all focused. And I, and I believe it's going to be a big success in America as it is a huge success globally already. Final one on Fight Camp. You mentioned both of their names. Um, we did an interview with Joe Gallagher. You didn't mention his mm. name, but he spoke about Callum Swift potentially either facing Billy Joe Saunders or Zach Parker. Obviously, he holds a high ranking with the WBO. What can you tell us about that? Are those fights realistic for kind of Fight Camp slash social distance crowds? Well, I think they have to be at some point, Rob, because what do you, you know, what's the alternative? Just wait till next spring. You know, I mean, these guys, they need to fight. So what's going to be challenging is, is putting them in with, you know, in the big unifications and, you know, a, a non-pay-per-view fight. I think pay-per-view, if you're not going to start seeing a load of pay-per-views. You're going to see White Pavetkin and Katie Taylor, and you're going to see maybe Usyk Chisora, and then you're going to see AJ against Putin. That's your pay-per-views for 2020, okay? So in an ideal world, more pay-per-views would generate more money to be able to do Warrington against Kanzu or... Callum Smith against Benavidez or Plant and so forth or Danny Jacobs but they're going to have to be very strong fights to bring back pay-per-view with no crowd and we're kind of hoping Rob that we'll be in a position where once we get to September, October you know my dad's already talking about maybe trialling some kind of crowd for the snooker and I think all sports will be trying to do the same and I think we'll get to a stage hopefully in September, October where you will be allowed a certain number or a certain percentage capacity in these arenas. Can you do Billy Joe Saunders versus Callum Smith not on pay-per-view? No, no, absolutely not. No, no way. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a seven, the big seven figure purses for both guys. It's, it's a career defining fight. That's a pay-per-view fight. And, uh, you know, again, we don't want to come back. We want to come, one of the reasons we wanted to come back to fight camp is to, we don't want to come back to a pay-per-view. We want to come back with three really good weeks. And then I want to go into the Dillian White event, which was always going to be a pay-per-view. It's not like we've just sprung it on you. You know, um, so yeah. Uh, with Billy Joe, just before we move on, is the Canelo fight now dead? I don't think it's dead, but I mean, you know, obviously, and this goes, you know, it's, it's no secret. If you were driving a, say, seven or eight million dollar gate, and now that's disappeared, you're going to be looking at your numbers of the show and think, well, where does that seven or eight million come from? And basically, that's going to come from reducing purses. So does Canelo take a little bit less? Does the opponent take less? We've not had a conversation yet. I would think they're trying to find a cheap opponent. But the danger with that is cheap opponent, as we've seen with the top rank stuff, means poor fight. And we don't want a poor Canelo fight. So, you know, I'm sure DeZone are having conversations with Golden Boy and Canelo to try and find the right option. We're talking about Anthony Durrell, Eddie. 
Yeah, poor fight. Very poor fight. I and mean, that's the kind of fight we don't want to come back with. We want, we want the Billy Joe Saunders fight. We agreed it before. If we need to have a discussion about money, I'm sure we will. Um, but that's the fight that people would like to see. And I think we need to bounce back with something like that. Okay, moving on to any other business. It's been a few weeks since I've spoken to you. It seems like the world in that period of time has somewhat burnt down to the ground. Um, let's start with Anthony Joshua. Anthony Joshua obviously made the headlines for his recent appearance at the Black Lives Matter protest in Watford. Just your open the floor to you for your thoughts on, on the criticism you received, really. I think people interpret things in the way they want to interpret things or they're built to interpret things. Um, you know, I'm not going to go into what he said and people think might think that's a cop-out, but you can't really win, Rob, to be honest with you. I heard the speech, I watched it live. At the time, I didn't think a great deal of it. Then I saw clips of it and obviously we know that it was someone else's speech. We know that he chose to read it out. He shouldn't have done that and he knows he shouldn't have done that, but he's not going to shy away from that. It's easy for me to say, oh, well, he read someone's speech. It wasn't even his words. He read it. Do you know what I mean? So you can't, you can't just say, oh, nothing to do with me. So he, he takes that on the chin. Um, he did throw a few words in. I think once he read a few things that it, where he wanted to explain it, where he talks about it, and that goes for all communities, you know, as if you watch it back. Um, it's difficult because I know him inside out. And so when I watch that, it doesn't offend me. It doesn't seem controversial to me because I know it. Can I see how it might have been taken in a wrong way? Maybe if you're built like that, if you've got a mind like that. But one thing I'll tell you about Anthony Joshua is, I mean, in terms of racist, like you couldn't be further from the truth. In terms of someone that wants to live with equality and with fairness, absolutely. And probably one of the most genuine individuals I've ever met in my life. Probably, and, and not sounding like a fanboy, but one of the most inspiring individuals as well. But, a very passionate individual. And as much as this has kicked him in the nuts, and he's he's really upset by this, I've got to say, he won't stop talking up for what he believes in. And I believe he's going to drop some content later this week talking about what he said and talking about his thoughts. And you know, no one's going to feel sorry for Anthony Joshua, but that's been a bit of a rough time for him. No one likes to be called a racist. It's a horrible thing, especially when you're not. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I feel... <laughs> It's like he chose not to go to the big rally in Hyde Park and, you know, which some sort of celebs have done and stuff like that. He went to his own community to try and inspire that community, to try and promote fairness. And it, it backfired on him. Like I said, you can't really win. So um, clean hearts win. Clean hearts win. And I know Anthony Joshua inside out. I've known him for eight years and he's one of the most genuine individuals I've ever met. And we will continue to support him. Well, we've had this incident. We also had the Instagram incident with Eddie Chambers a number of years ago. Do you accept that there are going to be some fans who have looked and interpreted his words in a particular way that mean that they're no longer going to purchase pay-per-views, they're no longer going to be an Anthony Joshua fan? You know, at the end of the day, Rob, that's always down to the, the customer and the fan. If you don't realise what Anthony Joshua is all about, then that's on you. Everyone's got an individual. I mean, you might think, I'm a prick and you don't want to watch my shows. Don't bother me. At the end of the day, as long as you're true to yourself, as long as you're real, it don't really matter. And that's why I say well, clean hearts win. Because if you've got a clean heart and if you're a good person, <laughs> sorry. Sorry about that. that's all that matters. And, you know, I know that he has got a clean heart. I know he's a great person. So I'm happy. If he fights Anthony Joshua, you're not going to buy it. Uh, sorry, if he fights Tyson Fury, you not want to buy the Tyson Fury fight because you don't like him all of a sudden. It's up to you, mate. But ultimately, this guy's done a huge amount, and you can't win. You know, one minute it's, oh, this guy never speaks out. Eddie Hans, he's, he's, you know, his puppet and does what. Then all of a sudden, he goes to a rally. He goes, oh, I watched this guy. So forget about it. You don't worry about what people think. Be true to yourself and, and be yourself. And I know what he is. You mentioned Tyson Fury fight. Obviously, I think the next day or within within a couple of days of that was the mm -hmm. announcement um, from yourself with Sky Sports about the deal being made with Look. Tyson Fury. Um, you know, I'll say one thing. I wouldn't say it was a stitch-up, but it definitely wasn't an announcement. You know, one thing that we had done is we had agreed with Tyson Fury's team that we would take this fight and we would agree now we will do a two-fight deal in 2020 on the terms that we discussed and everyone was on board. 
Terms agreed. Now let's move to contract. And I obviously said that on Sky. And next thing, Fury, AJ, done for, and it went absolutely mental. So there are a number of hurdles to overcome. There is no fight yet, but the basis of the interview was the fight is agreed. Anthony Joshua has agreed to fight Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury has agreed to fight Anthony Joshua. And one of the most difficult elements of any negotiation is the financial terms, and they are all agreed. So we're in great shape, but we still have a long way to go until the fight. Bob Arum and Frank Warren obviously were quick to come out and say that this wasn't new information. Why Why announce, I say announce, why say that then when, I mean, for Bob Arum, Bob Arum said that this was nothing new considering the conversations that you'd had four to six weeks ago. Why mention it then? Because we'd exchanged uh, stuff in writing that week. And of course, we'd never done that before. I mean, there'd never been any conversations before last week saying, are we, are we on board? And confirmation in writing that we're on board so fucking a lot's changed but unfortunately Bob you know I've done the interview without Bob doing the interview and you have to understand how boxing works Rob that if you do that all of a sudden Bob and Frank throw their toys out the pram and say well why didn't you know, why are you announcing that I never got to say that what and then the next thing statements are going out press releases are going out it wasn't it was just an interview to say we've agreed the fight we know there's fights in between. We know we've got to sort out a venue. We know there'll be issues to overcome with what broadcaster will air it. But that's stuff to move on to now once we proceed with contract. But the great news for fight fans is those two world heavyweight champions have agreed to fight each other on agreed terms. Eddie, I, I struggle to believe that you didn't realise what kind of impact you having doing that interview would have made on people, particularly the casual market. No, I, want, I wanted... I wanted to give people the news, for sure. You know, and because it's fucking great news. And it's the fight you want to see, right? And I've got a big mouth. So, but yeah, once we agree something, I'm going to get it out of there. And you saw Tyson Fury confirm it a couple of minutes later. We did see Tyson Fury confirm it a couple of minutes later. And obviously part of the... the well, the headlines, as it were, were what Tyson Fury announced in thanking Daniel Kinahan, his advisor, for his role in making this fight. What did you make of the backlash from that announcement from Tyson Fury regarding Daniel Kinahan? Um, you know, I think in boxing, people realise that he represents a number of fighters. Um, and for Tyson Fury, he is his advisor. So it's nothing new, really, to the people in boxing. Um I think that people think that he just popped up from from nowhere. He's been advising fighters for many, many years, and he's been advise, advising Tyson Fury for many, many years. And, um, yeah, a little surprise, but obviously I don't think it was a surprise to anyone in boxing. Now, we've seen, obviously, a lot of people come out and, and speak about Daniel Kinahan's role as an advisor and the fact that he is has done an awful lot for both fighters, managers and promoters. But we've also seen the flip side of that with the allegations that have come out about him um, from the Irish High Court and Parliament. What's your relationship with Daniel and how long have you worked with him? Well, he's been an advisor for a number of high-profile fighters for a number of years. So it's very difficult if you work in the sport of boxing not to have dealt with him at some time. Um, in this instance, it's really quite straightforward in the respect of doing a deal to make a fight. Anthony Joshua is Anthony Joshua and Eddie Hearn and Matram. That's it. And Tyson Fury's side is the four people that I talked about previously. So when you get told that, you know, the person leading the discussions is X, then you deal with that person and you get it done. And I think probably in this situation, Bob, they're prob uh, Bob, Bob, well, it's Bob, I suppose, is... They probably looked at my relationship with Bob and my relationship with Frank and Tyson Fury and all those guys said, well, you know, maybe we wouldn't get it done. And listen, maybe we wouldn't have got it done by me working with Frank Warren to try and make that fight. So um, it's really a case of we will negotiate with who we're told to negotiate with. And, you know, like I said, it's not, it's not a surprise to anyone in boxing because everybody knows that he's been working in boxing a long time with a number of fighters. Now, you've got Frank Warren, Hall of Fame promoter, Bob Arum, Hall of Fame promoter, Eddie Hearn, not to stroke your ego, future well, Hall of Fame promoter. Future, you know, yeah. With three of arguably the greatest promoters in the history of the sport, adding a few others along the way, what was it that you couldn't get done that you needed the influence of Daniel Kinahan? 
don't, I don't know if it's the influence or if it's just a calm head or a neutral. You know, I mean, I don't think it's always going to be very difficult with myself and Frank Warren to make a fight. We've never spoke. I mean, you only have to look at a Frank Warren interview that if my name comes up, I mean, it's about 190 beats per minute, you know, and it's something that I do to him that just ten sends him over the edge. Um, and you know, I always try and keep a balanced mind. Bob's a lot better, actually. Bob, Bob will like, I mean, Bob, I saw an interview the other day where Bob started calling me, I think he called me an arsehole or something else. And there was actually some, some worse. And I watched it. And literally, five minutes later, he called me. And he was like, hey, Eddie, how's it going, mate? And I'm like, <laughs> hold on. I swear I just watched an interview with you calling me an arsehole. But Bob's very good at sort of just forgetting about that. And I'm trying to think I'm the same person. I don't think Frank's the same kind of mole. So... I think, I don't know, you know, I think if you look at the previous um, moves of Tyson Fury, particularly signing with ESPN and, and Bob Arum, you know, I think that sometimes a neutral head in any situation or any negotiations is, is beneficial to a deal. I've spoke to Frank numerous occasions over the years and he said that he would always be willing to do it on a 50-50 split. It, it, from the out, I say from the outside looking in, obviously working in the media and boxing, a 50-50 split with a 60-40 to the, the winner in the rematch doesn't seem like the most complex of principles to, to put into place. That's not. I mean, you still have to get fighters to agree. They've still got to want to take the fight. But really, there is a number of other conversations that have taken place. And by the way, you know, the conversations have really been led by um, you know, myself from my, and, and probably Bob has, has had involvement as well. You know, I've spoke to Bob a number of times about it as well. Um, but I think what you say is correct, but it's having that willingness to move forward, Rob. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's hard to explain, but now when there's some, when it's, when it's petty between people, particularly between fighters, and I don't get that with AJ Fury, I don't think you're going to have that issue, but there's still so much to overcome that wouldn't seem a lot to you, but things like, all right, okay, who goes first on the poster, Right? Frank wouldn't want to give an inch to me, right? So that would almost be like personal. I've got to get, I can't get the poster first. You know, I, like, but that might not matter to me. But you understand what you deal with. In this, whereas you might have a conversation with someone else who goes, listen, mate, do you want to toss a coin? And everyone goes, yeah, right. Like, I think if you said that to Tyson Fury, if you said that to AJ, maybe they'd agree to that. And that's this is all stuff to be unfolded. But I think when you, and then you talk about Sky, you talk about ESPN, you talk about The Zone, you talk about, BT, that's all got to be sorted out as well. And I think those hurdles would be even difficult, more difficult to overcome with someone like Frank Warren, especially with the tingling that he gets when I'm, I'm mentioned. So I think it would be very difficult to do that. And you know, this was clearly a way that you know, maybe Tyson Fury felt there's more chance of this fight happening this way. Well, I'm due to catch up with Frank today, so I will ask him about that tingle. Um, you oh, met you be, yeah, I'm sure you'll enjoy that. <laughs> you mentioned um, BT and the role of the broadcasters. BT and Sky uh, came out and distanced themselves from the negotiations in the immediate aftermath of certainly Tyson Fury's announcement. That surprised me. I don't recall that ever happening before. Did it surprise you? I just think there's no fight yet, Rob. So I think, you know, I think it's very easy. to They've not been involved in any negotiations or any discussion about this fight. And until the fight's done and signed, they won't be. So I think, you know, the easy thing for them to say was the truth, which is, well, we've not been involved in any discussions. And at the moment, there's no fight. So when there is, we'll have a discussion. But you didn't find that particularly unusual in the wake of certainly Tyson Fury mentioning... Sorry, you've gone. Sorry, right, it's my battery. No problem. Uh, no, I just think, you know, obviously there was a lot of demand for something to be said. And what they said was both of them said, the same thing, which is the truth, which is we've not had one discussion about it and there's no fight contract, we haven't been approached about it. And until we do, I think it's not just that situation. I think any situation where if there was any remote controversy, that a broadcaster would say the same kind of thing. Every event, every sports right is negotiated or considered on its merits and right now we have nothing to consider. Okay, and just final one on, on that. Obviously, given the fact that you're a, you're a sports promoter, Daniel Kinahan, as I've mentioned before in this interview, never been convicted of any crimes, but obviously the allegations against him, you're happy to be dealing with him with regards to this fight? I, I have a job to make the biggest fight 
in the history of our sport. Okay? Everybody wants to see that fight. My job, my one job for Anthony Joshua is to try and take him to the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world. And I will do whatever I have to do to try and achieve that. And as I said before, Anthony Joshua is Anthony Joshua and Eddie Hearn and Matron and AJ Boxing and his, his 258 and his management team. That's how, when we go into negotiations, there's only two people really that go into negotiations, me and Anthony Joshua. And Anthony Joshua is the boss, 110% every day of the week. He is my boss. I work for Anthony Joshua. On Tyson Fury's side, you've got Tyson Fury, you've got MTK, you've got Frank Warren, you've got Daniel Kinney. And the person selected by them to negotiate uh, with me was Daniel Kinahan. So that's what I went and done. And we got to a point where we're in good shape to make the fight. We spoke about um, about governing bodies at the start of the interview. We've seen Paco Valcarcel and Mauricio Sullivan, who's obviously been in the headlines for some other reasons, come out and say that they want their mandatory challenger to be satisfied, so to speak, before any undisputed title fight. Can Joshua Fury, you know, are you keen to have that fight happen regardless of whether or not it's for the undisputed title? Uh, that's another hurdle to overcome, which we discussed. I mean, look, 100% Anthony Joshua's aim has always been to be undisputed champion. Now, does Tyson Fury have to fight Dillian White? We will be, by the way, we will be doing everything we can. And, you know, I saw Frank's comments about Dillian White as well. You know, we will be doing everything we can <coughs> for the WBC to honour their agreement with Dillian White. And we wrote to the WBC last week with Tyson, with uh, Dillian White and with his legal team as well to put pressure on them. So Dillian knows the work that's going on behind the scenes and there's a lot of it. And the WBC must honour that. Now, do we have to fight Alexander Usyk before? Possibly. Is there a deal to be done? Possibly. Would the WBO allow it? Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? But, Yes, in answer to your question. We really want this fight to be undisputed, but I please don't think that it's, oh, let's just push Dillian White to the side. Dillian White actually has to take priority, in my opinion, over Anthony Joshua before they meet to get that shot, and we will do everything we can to deliver that for Dillian White. So you'd be interested in making Joshua Fury if, for example, I don't know, Joshua was stripped of the WBO belt, you would still go all I ahead think, I think fight. that's the decision. But at the end of the day, I wouldn't stop this fight from happening if we didn't have all the belts. This is a fight that everybody has to see. This is a fight that everybody wants to see. We must, 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 must deliver this fight, whatever it takes for the sport of boxing. Otherwise, what's the fucking point? You've got two Brits, two great world heavyweight champions, and they can fight each other for the undisputed heavyweight world title. We're never going to get this chance. This is it. This is everything. This is fucking massive. So let's get it done. And if the governing bodies don't want to support it, fuck it, we'll make our own governing body up. We'll make it for the, the WDC, the World DOSA Championships. I don't know. Yeah, not not quite as catchy as some of the other titles. but Well, listen, we respect the governing bodies. We always support them. We want them on board. But we also have to do what's good for boxing at the same time making sure that mandatory challenges' rights are respected. We don't want the WBC to make Tyson Fury franchise champion, which Bob Arum suggests. Let him take care of his mandatory obligations, just like Joshua is taking care of his mandatory obligations as well. You, you kind of stepped on my next question with regards to the franchise title. We've spoken in the past, obviously Devin Haney, a good example of that. Yeah, the same thing. Down. Look, Aaron done the same thing there. No, um, Devin Haney fought for a, a world title final eliminator that became an interim world championship. The only reason we took that fight is so that he could be mandatory to Lomachenko. All of a sudden, he wins that. Bang. Top rank would suggest and, and uh, try and get approved Lomachenko to franchise champion. Done. You can't touch Lomachenko. You can't get at him. What's the point in striving for greatness if once you're about to touch it, someone just rips it away from you unfairly? This is the same with Dillian White. We don't want to fight for a vacant world championship or to be elevated from interim champion to WBC world champion. He wants to fight the champion. He wants to fight Tyson Fury. So, do as you promised, do as you said, February, end of February 2021, that fight must take place. Honour your word. And if Deontay Wilder is not ready this year, which I believe there is a chance he won't be, make sure Dillian White is the guy. He deserves it. Sweating my bollocks out. <laughs> 
If um, Tyson Fury is elevated to franchise champion and whatever happens with the WBC title, let's say Dillian White picks up the vacant WBC, is Joshua Fury still an undisputed world title fight? Whatever you want to call it, mate. I mean, this is the problem, isn't it? Is it undisputed if it's a WBC franchise? For me, yes, because it's, you know, it's, it's the major champions meeting. But I'd, I'd like to, for it to go down in history without any complaints. Does that somewhat devalue the WBC title if Dillian White was then to go and win it? Well, there was a franchise champion. Yeah, for sure. Because, look, Devin Haney's world champion. Now he's world champion, but he hasn't beaten a champion yet. He wants to be a champion. It's not his fault. But it's very hard to sit there and you can always call yourself a world champion, but deep down, you know there's going to be the naysayers and the purists who say, yeah, but... It's not the full WBC world title. And I know that every... It's the same with WBA regular, uh, Rob. It is a world championship, unquestionably. But they all want to win the super title. They don't want to be a regular champion, really. They want to be the guy that no one can say to them when they retire and they put their feet up on a coffee table, yeah, but you weren't a real world champion, were you? You know? So, that's where we're at. With regards to Dillian White and the WBC, I do appreciate your press for time, Eddie, so I'll make this quick. Um, was the WBC unwilling to give any kind of any insight as to whether or not they were able to keep the February 2021 date? Obviously, with coronavirus, with, everything's with, been pushed I, I wrote, back. I wrote to them, I wrote a long letter to them last week, spoke to Maurizio Suleiman. Um, Dillian's US lawyers have done the same, and we're waiting for answers. So, with, with that, they... Because when I've spoke to Mauricio about this in the past, obviously Dillian White's name has come up um, with regards to mandatory dates, etc. He said that, in his opinion, people are going to have to kind of look at the state of coronavirus and, and the fact that the schedule's been pushed back. Are you unwilling that, to that, accept that's, that? But, that's, but that's, that, that doesn't wash. And it does wash, wash in certain situations. But show me how the coronavirus has delayed Fury Wilder. It hasn't. It's the only fight that they were going to take this year. Oh, it might have happened in September. October. Now it might happen in November. It doesn't matter. It's still got to be Tyson Fury's next fight. You know, and hopefully Wilder doesn't take this fight and we can just do Fury against White at the end of this year. Do you think that's realistic? I do. He's gone very quiet. I don't know. I'd like to hear more. I'd like to hear, I'm ready, I'm training, I'm coming for you. I'm not really hearing that. I've uh, had my interview request declined, unfortunately. Mm, there you go. So we will have to wait and see. Um, one thing before I let you go, um, we've gone way over the 20 minutes that you've given me. I oh, know, so. thanks for that. Yeah, cheers, Eddie. Um, your old mate, Jarrell Miller, seen today on yeah. Twitter that he has been re-awarded his, his boxing license. Started. Well, I would like to, Eddie. Your thoughts on that? Now, listen, I can't, it's hard because I like Jarrell Miller. Do you know what I mean? Like, I had a good relationship with him and, and you know, he pulled my heartstrings. But what he'd done was bang out of order and unacceptable. And, you know, I see Bob Bennett and the Nevada Commission of, of licensing. Where are we? We're about a year since um, he failed a, three different drug tests for three different supplements. He's never been banned. But, you know, every commission will make their decision. We respect that. And listen, you know what, Rob? I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I can't believe it. I wish Jarrell Miller all the best. Do you know what I mean? Everybody makes mistakes. The only thing that bugs me, the hands never went up. Do you know what I mean? There's nothing better when you've made a mistake for your own peace of mind and for the public's peace of mind to say, you know what? I fucked up. I shouldn't have done it. I've done it. I'm sorry. I'll regret it for the rest of my life. It cost me the opportunity of a lifetime. But I'd like to move on with my life. I'd like you to say he fucked up, but, you know, but that never happened. And that's the, probably the thing that eats me up the most. You know, there was no call to me to say, for all the opportunities you gave me, I fucked up, I'm sorry, and I shouldn't have done it, but I hold my hands up, I don't know what else to tell you, and I would look to him, I said, you know what, Jarrell, fair play, mate, everybody fucked up, everybody makes mistakes, and now it's about how you bounce back, but until there's that acceptance of the mistake, and still, and still there's that, that public hands up that says, look, I know you're going to judge me, I know you're going to have your opinion on me, but I'll tell you now, I hold my hands up, I messed up, I made a bad call, and I shouldn't have done it, and I'm sorry. So I would appreciate your forgiveness. I'm going to get on with my career and my life. You support me, you don't support me, but I want to say I'm sorry. And I never got that. That's all. Considering the state of boxing and, and with drug cheats and people who do fail drugs tests, I mean, I can't remember for the life of me the last time a fighter came out and held his hands up. 
if we're going to continually allow these guys back into the sport without real well, proper no, Rob, explanation, Rob, where, where does that take us as a sport? But, but Rob, every test has, every failed test has different merits, right? And many will say, just throw the book at everyone. And I'm not saying that I'm against that, that ethos. But when you're talking about someone who might take a over-the-counter supplement and you know, and you look at a su- substance and, oh, listen, I don't know the science, but when you look at a guy that's failed three tests for three different substances and has injected shit inside him, it's very different to me, you know? And maybe I don't know, maybe there's other people that are taking stuff to do this, but it's just, this is a pure out-and-out out cheat case. Not, I'm not, you know, me, me, this is a cheat case. It's nothing else. No mistake. Yeah, you can say oh, it was a mistake. This bloke gave me this. Come on, mate, you're sticking needles in you. You ain't taking a fucking Barocca. Anyway, like I said, honestly, I wish Jerome Miller all the best. I wish him the best, his team his best, his family the best. And when I see him, I will shake his hand. But I just wish things would have been different. That's all. Okay. Well, Eddie Hearn, I've taken up enough of your time. Thanks very, right, mate. thanks very much for speaking to Boxing Social as always, and I look forward to catching up with you soon. Cheers, Rob. Cheers, mate.